Hello, everyone. We're just going to take a couple of minutes and um, let folks get logged in. So welcome. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. If you want to, you're welcome to say hello to us using the chat. Tell us who you are and where you're coming from and what your favorite election was to vote in or will be if you haven't yet voted. <laughs> By all means, say hello. And we'll just wait for everyone to give everyone a minute to get into the virtual room and um, push this stream out also to Facebook. So thanks folks for joining us. All right. All right, we have some voters. 1992, first election you were old enough to vote in. Thanks, Matt. Oh, voter education from Multnomah County. Oh, thanks, everyone. Favorite election so far, 1972. Lori's got her eye on this fall, I think. <laughs> so we're just welcoming everyone into the room. If you want to say, say hello and use the chat and tell us your favorite uh, election that you voted in so far, or one that you're eagerly anticipating. Um, and thanks for joining us. Just give it a couple minutes and make sure everyone can get in before we formally begin the program. Oh, someone voted in 2008 Ooh. and got to attend the inauguration in 2009. That sounds like fun. <laughs> Present. Welcome, Robin. <laughs> Thanks for saying hello, folks. We're just waiting for everyone to get in the room. Feel free to use the chat to say hello. Um, tell us your interest in voting or a wonderful election that you voted in. <laughs> Sandy says this next one's going to be her favorite. Heck yeah. Thanks, everyone. All right. Oh, awesome. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone. Yes, we're set up as a broadcast here. Um, so you can see the presenters, but you won't be able to show your beautiful faces to us. So please uh, feel free to do, um, say hello in the chat. Tell us about your favorite election that you voted for. And then we'll use the Q&A function for Q&A with all our panelists. My name's Eliza Canty-Jones. I work at the Oregon Historical Society. And I'm so pleased to welcome you all today to this program. Uh, we're coming to you today uh, from Portland, Oregon. Uh, one of the wonderful things about virtual programs is you can be joining us from anywhere. So welcome, everyone. Uh, here in Portland, we're on the traditional homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and the many other na indigenous nations of the Columbia River. And as always, we really encourage folks to think about the fact that here in Oregon and across the United States, you're always on Indian land. And we encourage folks to take advantage of the opportunities that you have to learn about indigenous history and indigenous culture, to learn about the theft of lands, to learn about things like termination and restoration, and to learn about the uh, resilience and the ongoing and ancestral relationships of indigenous peoples with the plants and animals and land uh, here in Portland and across the United States. At the Oregon Historical Society, our mission is to preserve our state's history and make it accessible to everyone in ways that advance knowledge and inspire curiosity about all the peoples, places, and events that have shaped our state. We do this work in so many ways, many of them right now virtually and online. So we really encourage you to connect with us. Um, I think we have the next slide tells a little bit about upcoming programs. 
Today's program is in celebration of our exhibit, Nevertheless, They Persisted. Uh, it's a history of women's voting rights in the 19th Amendment. And sorry, we went through quickly there. Our incredible sponsors, thank you sponsors for making the exhibit possible. We are open to the public from Wednesdays through Sundays, 10 till five, with all kinds of precautions in place to make sure to keep folks safe if you care to come visit the exhibit please do, but also know we're keeping the exhibit open at least until mid-May next year because we want to make sure we have the opportunity for everyone to see it. If you're not already signed up to follow the Oregon Historical Society on social media or through our email blasts, please do. We have a couple of upcoming events. One is the Chalk the Vote project that we're doing in partnership with the Oregon Women's History Consortium, which will be a great opportunity for folks to think about the history of voting rights, make sure that you're registered to vote, encourage other people to learn the history of voting rights, get registered, vote, and do some creative work around those amendments and this history. Also mark your calendars now. We'll have another lecture on September 16th on suffrage history. Um, and then I think our next slide tells all about other ways to stay involved. And as always, we are enormously grateful to the members and the individual and corporate and foundation donors who make the work of the Oregon Historical Society possible. Thank you so much. We're really just incredibly gratified to see fantastic support from our members and donors over the past few months. We couldn't be more grateful. And of course, the good people of Multnomah County have now voted twice to enact a modest property tax levy that supports the Oregon Historical Society and four historical societies in East Multnomah County. So thank you, Multnomah County residents. We're really grateful for that. Today's program, each of our panelists will tell a, a story um, as they, however they see fit about suffrage and voting history that they think is important. I'll introduce each one in turn They'll offer their, their um, commentary, their story, their history, and then we will open it up for Q&A. You can, you, you can ask questions by using the Q&A function on Zoom. If you're following us on Facebook Live, go ahead and just put your question into the comment on the live there and we will, um, they'll get it to me and I'll get it to our panelists. So I'm grateful, I should say, to all of our panelists. Everyone who's speaking today served as an advisor to our exhibit. OHS's Curator of Exhibits and Special Projects, Lori Erickson, is the mastermind behind the work of the exhibit, and she couldn't have done it without the uh, incredible folks on our panel today who advised her and researched and gave all kinds of wonderful um, information and documents and ideas and questions. So thank you all, advisors. The work of OHS wouldn't be possible without folks like you, so we appreciate it. Our first speaker today is Kimberly Jensen, who is a professor of history and gender studies at Western Oregon University. She's a board member of the Oregon Women's History Consortium. I should also note she's a former member of the editorial board of the Oregon Historical Quarterly and guest editor of our fall 2012 special issue on women and citizenship. So Kimberly Jensen, over to you. Thank you, Eliza. I'm so honored to be part of this panel uh, and so eager to hear what my colleagues are going to say. And I also want to thank all of you that are tuning in and also to thank the Historical Society for um, having this exhibit and especially to Eliza for her vision. The story I wanted to tell about the exhibit involves someone that I spent a lot of time with, uh, Esther Pohl Lovejoy. Uh, I wrote a biography of her and I, in thinking about what I wanted to say today, I really wanted to emphasize that she understood and tried to um, build the idea that the vote is a very important tool. It's not just that we have the vote, but it's that what we do with the vote, that the vote empowers us in our communities. Uh, Lovejoy was Portland's city health officer. And I've been thinking about that a lot as we've been experiencing COVID. Uh, in 1907 to 1909, she served in that capacity. And um, in 1907, Portland and the Pacific Rim was threatened by the bubonic plague. And um, she was able to uh, use the media, use organizations like women's clubs to build a coalition to get the city council to fund cleanup measures. And she wrote after 
Oregon Women Achieved the Vote in 1912, she wrote uh, to Ruth McCormick, who was uh, a, a, uh, an Illinois Chicago suffragist, responding to the question, why are you in favor of votes for women? And she said, I draw on my experience as city health officer when it was men's business, and by that she meant the commercial interests of the city. When, when plague threatened, men on the city council voted right away to you know, take action against the plague. However, there was also an ongoing additional or parallel movement for pure milk in Portland. And she said, this was considered women's business, even though uh, people sickened and died, even though she herself lost her son to what was considered uh, tainted milk. A room full, a city full of women could not get pure milk legislation passed until they had the vote, until the cloud of the vote. And so she, she felt that it, that was one of the lessons that she learned, that yes, we have you know, yes, there's a lot of work to do, and, but the vote is a very empowering empowers the rest of our activism. And as I've been thinking about her, and if uh, you could have the next slide, please. I've been thinking a lot about contemporary issues and especially with my students who say, I don't know whether I want to vote or I'm not quite sure that my vote will count. And I recommend to everyone uh, Stacey Abrams' uh, June 4th New York Times editorial, I know voting feels inadequate right now. Uh, Abrams, of course, uh, was uh, in the race for governor of Georgia in 2018, a very important election, and she garnered the votes. She explains in this uh, editorial that voting makes sense if we also talk about what voting can do to empower us. If you're voting for governor, what can a governor do? The governor can uh, address Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, in our own situation, a governor can make plans and policies about COVID. So what she's saying is that voting still is that essential tool. It's not the end all, but it's a very important part of how we make social justice happen in our communities. So I'll put that um, in the chat. Uh, I'll put that um, uh, URL for her editorial and also encourage you to go to Fair Fight Action. You can see the uh, website there. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Kim. I appreciate that. Our next speaker is Angie Morrill who earned her PhD in Ethnic Studies at University of California, San Diego in 2016. Her fields of research include Native Feminisms, Indigenous Studies, and Critical Race Studies. She is the director of the Title VI Indian Education for Portland Public Schools and an enrolled member of the Klamath Tribes. And she also serves as an advisor to the Oregon Historical Quarterly on our editorial board. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Angie Morrill. Thank you so much. Um, it is an honor to, to be speaking here today, especially because, um, you know, I'm a lot of things, uh, but I'm not a historian. And so I'm going to speak more from home. Uh, my degree in ethnic studies definitely um, included history, but that is not necessarily my, you know, my area. So I'm going to pull back and say that there was once, and it wasn't very long ago, a belief that Native American women were anti-feminist. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, that was a response to white stream feminism that didn't recognize intersectionality, that important framing by Black scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, um, uh, resistance to the idea that all women faced the same struggles, and that all feminist struggles were serving all women. Uh, but that has never been true for women of color, and when it comes to the vote, it certainly isn't true. But I never believed that Native women didn't care about feminism and representation because I'm my mother's daughter, and my mother, Peggy Ball, uh, worked really hard in the 1970s in the Native community here in Portland. Uh, the Urban Indian Council was a men's council, and uh, she and her friends started a women's council to advise them, and it wasn't easy. They uh, succeeded because they 
well, they were supported by some very wise elders. Um, but when they first showed up, they were just asked to bring coffee to the men. Um, but eventually they, they got their, their council, Winya. And I also remember the first International Women's Day celebration here in Portland because I was there with my mom and my two sisters. And for every, every year we, we went for many years. Um, so my mom taught me that Native women can and do change society. She started a group for women to talk about what they wanted and what they wanted was childcare. But most of them uh, were in Head Start programs, a federal program. And, and the model I think more than, than now was really white savior based. And they wanted their small children, our most precious little ones to have culturally relevant childcare. And so I shared a, an article from the Oregon Journal um, with some pictures from Ikashkash. And then later on, um, they started another one called Pacific Indian Preschool Education Pipe. And I still have people, including like Laura John, the Portland Oregon's, uh, I'm Portland's um, tribal liaison for the city, uh, was in my mom's preschool class. And a woman I work with, Sunshine Guzman, and um, it was, uh, it was an important, it's an important thing to have for our children um, when they can see themselves reflected uh, in, in the people taking care of them. But so thinking about the past, one of the reasons I'm talking from home is because the archives don't support all stories. If narratives don't fit some uh, ideas and, and major narratives that are being told, um, then, then they're just not there. And so uh, you have to read the absences because if you don't, then you can tell you, then you just continue to tell stories that support white supremacy and that insist on uh, native absence and erasure. And my assumption is that always native women and native people are present and uh, very importantly present. Um, so speaking of the vote, you know, although we're celebrating uh, women gaining the vote, it wasn't until 1924 that Indians became citizens. And even then it was still up to the states to decide if Indians could vote. I'm saying Indians because this is how they're addressed by the federal government. And that wasn't guaranteed until the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And even then wasn't necessarily recognized and supported. And I mean, one of the few politically exciting things I can think of in the past two years are the ways that Native women have stepped up and women of color have become radical political voices on a national level. Sharice Davids from Kansas, Deb Hallin from New Mexico, uh, took seats in Congress in 2018. In Oregon, we have Thomas Sanchez, a Portland woman from Shoshone Bannock and Ute uh, tribes is our state representative. I'm really inspired by Native women and Native women activists. Um, I wanted to provide a link to the, the recent victory of McGirt versus Oklahoma. Uh, because Native women were a very important part of that victory. And these two uh, Native women scholars wrote an article where they argue how land and sovereignty is critical for the safety and protection of Native women. And I'm thinking about that safety and protection right now because at this moment, our city of Portland is occupied by federal troops. And the Portland police are collaborating with these occupiers in defiance of our city government and our governor. So it's a critical moment to think about what it means to have political power. And it's also a moment of dissonance because we are celebrating the vote, yet our city officials, officials that we voted to serve us, the citizens, have very little power in the face of these masked gunmen. It's hard to see what our vote may actually count for when we cannot provide peace and government, even in one city. And when our police force defy orders from their superiors to terrorize the citizens. I want to say that this is familiar for Native people. We know about the plenary power of Congress. We know the federal government has the right to break its own laws because we learned all about that with federal termination policy and the fight to have our legal treaties recognized and upheld. So to sum it up, I'd say I believe in the power of Native women and our creativity and our love for our land and our people and that we will always be here 
and will always persist and fight to govern ourselves as we see appropriate and right. And that we just, we have to continue to hope and fight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angie, for sharing that knowledge and those images and perspectives with us. We're grateful to have you here. Our next speaker is Janice Dilge, who is the principal of History Built, a historical consulting firm. She's also the curator of the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education's core exhibition, Discrimination and Resistance in Oregon Primer. And she is a co-founder and board member of the Oregon Women's History Consortium. So please join me in welcoming Jan Dilch. Thank you, Eliza. And thank you to everyone who's here. It's, it's great to be involved, even if not face to face. I'm going to talk about a really different uh, set of women. Um, and it's the anti-suffragists. It's a uh, part of Oregon suffrage history and national suffrage history that we don't know much about. And so I've been directing my research to the, this group of women who I might not like and definitely don't agree with, but their story is part of that entire history. And so that's why I've been working on it. And this is kind of my first draft and sharing it with anyone. So here we're looking at the national uh, anti-suffrage headquarters in New York City. And like many of the national suffrage organizations, this one really helped uh, provide materials, strategies, and talking points um, for all of the branches that they were created around the country, Oregon being one of those branches as well. And the anti-suffrage movement, their foundational ideal was that Gender roles, the way they were for the majority of people, certainly white men and women, um, were fine as they were. They wanted to keep the status quo of women being in the private sphere, taking care of family and home, while the men were in the public sphere, taking care of business and operating the levers of political power. And in fact, many anti suffragist women, um, and they were often the people running these organizations clearly stated they didn't want the responsibility of voting. They were fine with what they called household suffrage, meaning that the men in the family could make the laws, make the policies, make the decisions for them, and they were comfortable with that. Next slide, please. This anti-suffragist postcard sort of vividly illustrates another one of the key principles of the anti-suffrage movement. And that was, um, if women were involved in electoral politics, learning about candidates, taking all that time to go to the polls to vote, that would mean they were neglecting their domestic duties and therefore the husband, um, and certainly as you see here, the children, and that was just not to be tolerated. And even the term suffragette, which you see up in the corner of the postcard, was meant to be a denigration of suffragists, a diminution of that term suffragist. And so the anti-movement was very astute, um, as well as the suffragists, in figuring out how to visually get out their message. Next slide, please. And the Oregon Association opposed to the extension of suffrage to women, say that three times really rapidly. <laughs> um, they were the standard kind of anti-suffragist components, which were elite white educated women um, who very much cherished their status in society and didn't want to see that change at all. And the four women named or pictured here were really the heart and soul and the public face of the anti-suffragists in Oregon uh, from 1899 through 1912. And they were not into having public events or doing a lot of public debating as the suffragists were. Um, they really, one of their main tools was to place paid political ads. Um, they had the means to do that and they would, um, write these sort of letters to the editor or dear citizen, the four women would sign it at the end 
and they would place it in newspapers around the, the state as kind of their main way to get their message out. But because Oregon voted more times than any other state on the topic of women's suffrage, the fact that this had been voted on over and over again became one of Oregon anti-suffragists uh, strategies and talking points. And so they would do interviews or do these paid ads that were saying, suffragists, Oregon men have voted down extending the vote to women two, three, four, five times. The issue is settled. Stop putting it on the ballot. You're wasting our time. And it's clear that it means that the majority of men and women, their wives, their sisters, their daughters, don't want the vote. Well, that all changed, of course, in 1912, when suffrage was extended to many Oregon women. And so news stories and interviews with Bailey and McCammond um, asked, what are you gonna do now? And for Bailey, she said, I've never wanted the vote. I didn't work for it. I won't use it. And all evidence that I've uncovered so far says she stuck to her word. McCammon, on the other hand, took a different tack, as did many former anti-suffragists, which was, now that the vote is mine, it's my civic duty and responsibility to use it. And based on her voter registration card, we, we know that she did go out and vote after 1912. And I think one of the most interesting things for me as I've been exploring, particularly these four women, is that they never wrote any books. They never wrote any articles or talked extensively about the decades that they spent involved in this um, anti-suffrage crusade. And in fact, even looking at the obituaries of these four women, they were long lists of their philanthropy, the civic organizations, the cultural organizations that they were involved in. And there's not been a single mention that I found yet of their work for decades in the anti-suffrage movement, which I find fascinating and hope to explore more. And when I know more, I'll share it with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Really appreciate that dive into the antis, as they're so often called. Um, our next speaker is Judy Margles, who's the executive director of the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education, which explores the legacy of Jewish experience in Oregon, teaches the universal lessons of the Holocaust, and provides opportunities for intercultural conversation. Please join me in welcoming Judy Margles. I know you can't really join me like normal, but I can't stop <laughs> saying it. Yay, Judy. <laughs> Here I am. Um, Thank you, Eliza. Um, I also feel so fortunate to be with all of you, all of these great scholars who continue to inform our work at the museum. I also wanna just do a little shout out for historian Ellen Eisenberg, who has also been instrumental in helping us know more about Oregon Jews and women's suffrage. So I'm just gonna focus my brief remarks today on what can only be called the equivocal response of Portland's Jewish community leading up to the 1912 vote. So I'm, I'm just gonna sort of go a little chronologically, um, tell a few stories on the way. So at the time that um, or, or Oregon started to um, introduce the measure to vote, the Jewish residents mostly had come from an immigration from Central Europe that had begun in the 1850s. There were Jewish men who eagerly involved themselves in city and state affair. Jewish women were doing what many women were doing at the time. They cared for their families, they helped in family businesses, and they found ways to speak out about issues that concerned them the most. Before the vote in 1884, we really looking at just a very slight involvement of the Jewish community, but there's one particular firecracker who, who needs mention, Alice Friedlander in 1893, she was 17 years old. She spoke at the Portland Press Club where she so passionately proclaimed a woman's golden era, a time when the whole great world of activity is calling upon women and neither the attainable information nor skill unfits a woman for home and its sacred duties. Yay, Alice, right? But we'll see Jews becoming a bit more vocal in the lead up to the second vote in 1900. In 1896, when Susan B. Anthony returned to Portland to address the first annual meeting of the Oregon Congress of Women, there were several Jew Jewish owned businesses who showed support by advertising in Congress's program. Josephine Hirsch, had founded the Portland chapter of the Council of Jewish Women just two months earlier. 
she reported at the convention about the council activities. Her husband, Solomon Hirsch, openly supported women's suffrage, announcing, quote, I am naturally conservative, but I advocate women's suffrage because it is right. Abigail Scott Dunaway would go on to describe Solomon Hirsch as one of her early co-workers. Jews were not on the same page, however. In an 1897 speech at Portland's Beth Israel Synagogue, Lucius Solomons, who headed the California International Order of B'nai B'rith, spoke out in opposition to suffrage, stating that the home is the sphere for women to guide the reign of government. This would result in greater emancipation than all the struggles for the ballot could procure. Unfortunately, his words appear to have been received without opposition. And after the, 19, after the failure of the 1900 vote, we're seeing only a smattering of Jewish support. At the 1905 National Convention, no Jewish businesses advertised in the program, and the Portland Council of Jewish Women refrained from participating. It's really a surprising shift that the council did not participate in the vote for suffrage. Um, they had a, a track record of taking stands on gendered issues. 1896, for example, a federal bill had proposed admitting Oklahoma and Arizona to the union on condition that the right of suffrage in those states should never be abridged except on account of illiteracy, minority, sex, conviction of felony, or mental condition. Council had sent a letter to Congress protesting the inclusion of the word sex. So the local chapter's silence at the National Convention, it really indicates the complexities of suffrage support when sent against, set against the interests of the community. It was likely related to a second perennial ballot issue from the same period, prohibition. Dunaway and others had tried to separate suffrage and prohibition, but the Oregon prohibitionists supported the suffrage cause in the belief that once enfranchised, women would vote for a dry state. Many within the Jewish community had businesses tied to the sale of liquor. A vote for suffrage could mean a loss of business. Thus, the Jewish community continued to exhibit lackluster support in the 1910 vote. Josephine Hirsch pushed the council to endorse women's suffrage, but the council declined to back the campaign formally, stating the need to focus on philanthropic goals. To prepare for the 1912 vote, as we all know, Oregonians created a host of new suffrage leagues but not one for Jews. Here, Josephine Hirsch emerged as a key leader. She founded and chaired the Portland Equal Suffrage League. Apparently, she was so dedicated to her work that she installed a telephone plug in every room in her home that she, so she could get incoming suffrage calls wherever she might be. Suffrage, suffrage gatherings in her home made the society pages and were credited with converting some of those most staunchly opposed to the suffrage cause. And then there was one of my favorites, the Oregon Jew Jewish Booster Club. They dedicated themselves to supporting the measure, consisted of Jewish boys. They had a girl mascot. These were um, kids from Eastern European, um, the Eastern European immigrant neighbor of South Portland. This was an emigration that had started at the beginning of the turn of the century. So you're gonna see other Jewish immigrant um, groups getting involved for the 1910, the 1912 vote. The months prior to the November 5th election, there was a flurry of activity on both sides of the campaign. When Elizabeth Nichols lectured in Portland in October of 1912, the Jewish Tribune, a local newspaper, they'd been previously opposed to, suff to suffrage, but they profiled her favorably. However, right before the election, the paper ran an anti-suffrage editorial entitled A Protest where the editor enumerated arguments against women's suffrage and noted that the material was not a paid advertisement. On another page, however, the paper ran an item headed, women should vote, and they numbered 10 reasons why this was true. And barely two weeks before the vote, two weeks before the vote, you have the president of Beth Israel Synagogue, Sig Sichel, delivering his annual address to the congregants. You would think maybe he would mention something about the vote, he does mention Jewish women. He mentions the proliferation of Jewish prostitutes, but he never once mentioned Jewish, uh, women's suffrage. And I'm just gonna end with a story I think speaks to this present moment. It comes from an oral history of Carrie Hervin in our collection. Carrie Hervin joined the League of Women Voters, became its president during the Second World War. When she was told that if you can't just hold the organization together until the end of the war, that is all that can be expected, she responded, if that is all you want, I will never accept 
the presidency. If the League of Women Voters does not have a purpose to serve during the time of war, it should just be, it should just disband. She made it her mission to ensure that the most representative persons were running for office and that questionable, questionable measures were not put over on the American people while the nation's attention was diverted to the war. She believed and furthered the role of the League as the watchdog of the government. And best of all, she passed that sense of responsibility to her daughter, Barbara Hervin Schwab, who would be elected first president of the League in 1952, less than a decade after her mother's term as president. As Karen Brodkin wrote in How Jews Became White Folks, the eagerness to be white is not hard to understand since whiteness is a state of privilege and belonging. I do not think that the Jewish response to women's I do think that the Jewish response to women's suffrage is consistent with the way that the Jewish community sought to achieve acceptance in the community at large. It was a way for them to do well by doing good, establishing social networks, participating in community matters, allowing individual women to use their voices, but ultimately making decisions that were deemed best for their community. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. And thanks. Um, many of our attendees have started putting some questions and things in the Q&A, so please continue to feel free to use that. Thanks, everyone. Our final panelist today is Linda Tamura, who is Professor Emerita of Education at Willamette, Willamette University and co-editor-in-chief of the Oregon Encyclopedia, and just in case you don't know, the Oregon Encyclopedia is an online compendium of all things Oregon history and culture, uh, and it is ever building and ever growing. You can find it online at OregonEncyclopedia.org. It's a publication of the Oregon Historical Society, and we're really proud of it. So we want folks to make good use of it. So please join me in welcoming Linda Tamura. Thank you. I'm thrilled to join all of you amazing women. I need to be careful that I don't take for granted my rights, including my right to vote. My grandmother wasn't able to vote until she was 58 years old. And my mom lost her vote for three years during World War II. In 1986, I was able to interview 11 immigrant Japanese women, my grandmother's generation. And one of the things I most remember was when we talked about their ability to get citizenship and to be able to vote. There was a, a real joy. So before I share those moments, I'd like to share a little bit of the background that led to that. Um, and thanks, Sarah, for helping with the slides. Uh, the first generation of Japanese women were the Issei. And when they immigrated, to the United States in the early 1900s, they were aliens ineligible for citizenship. Next slide. They worked alongside their husbands on farms, in hotels, in stores. Uh, they weren't visible, but they sacrificed. Uh, they wanted to raise their children so they would be good American citizens. I remember one woman talked about working 10 hours on the farm and then coming home and dealing with housework and uh, meals and taking care of the children. Another woman told me about women who wore boots to bed because that way they wouldn't have to spend time early in the morning lacing their boots up before they went out to work. Next. Uh, next slide, sir. During World War II, um, those of Japanese descent were forced to leave their homes and were incarcerated on American soil. Uh, those who were American citizens, including my mother, were unable to vote. Next. When they returned to my hometown, in fact, there was not a warm welcome, and they were discouraged from coming back. In fact, uh, there were petitions signed by more than 1,800 people telling them not to come home. And still, they chose to make America their home. Next. In 1952, the McCarran-Walter Act passed. And that allowed Issei and other Asian immigrants the chance to apply for citizenship and also to vote. 
in Hood River, they took naturalization classes where they studied American government and US history. Next. And in 1954, 27 of them, including my grandparents, were able to gain citizenship. Next. Mrs. Hama Yamaki uh, told me that she studied with her Japanese dictionary right next to her manual of American government and history. I studied the questions, she told me, and I practiced writing out the answers. My husband and I quizzed each other. I even learned the Pledge of Allegiance in case they asked me to recite it. I studied so hard that I felt I just had to pass. Afterward, she wrote a haiku about that experience. After I was older, I achieved American citizenship and greeted a new year. This is Mrs. Hama Yumaki. She told me, I felt privileged to be able to cast my vote. Excuse me, uh, Mrs. Tay Endo. Thank you. Uh, she said, I felt uh, privileged to be able to cast my vote. We studied sample ballots and we talked to our friends about issues that were coming up. I finally felt, she told me, that my one vote may have mattered. And finally, Shizue Iwatsuki. In 1923, she co-organized the Japanese Women's Society of Hood River to help immigrant women learn American culture. She was the first Hood River Issei woman to gain her driver's license so she could run errands for other people. And when her husband fell in the orchard and became paralyzed, she ran the family's 20 acre farm by herself. In 1974, she was honored by Emperor Hirohito for her poetry. And that same year, she was named Hood River Woman of the Year. She wrote a Tonka poem after this. A naturalized citizen now, I have the right to vote. So today, I climb the steps of this building. Let's keep climbing. Thank you, everyone. Um, really appreciate this huge variety of perspectives. And so we're going to throw it open to questions now. We have um, a few questions already. So thanks for everyone who has sent those in. And some of the questions have to do with um, the anti-suffragists and these ideas of being opposed to suffrage. Um, so there's a question from someone of whether there was, um, if they have found, if any of you have found evidence in your research of women of color who were opposed to suffrage. Um, and then there's another question uh, that has to do with citizenship privileges, or which are racialized or gendered people, such as an example that spreading those citizenship privileges can be read by dominant society as a reduction of the rights for the privilege. Um, and so perhaps the anti-suffragists were assuming that if all women could vote, then their privilege status, perhaps a privilege status of whiteness or of class, um, might be reduced. So can any of you speak to some of the anti-suffrage um, evidence that you found in your research and how it might have intersected with race and class in ways? And I would say you can also extend this out to citizenship if, it's, if, you, if it extends there, but not exactly to suffrage. Any thoughts on that? I haven't yet, but I'm early in my research, um, found any, anyone other than white women who were anti-suffrage. Um, I expect to find some, um, but I just haven't as of yet. And um, at least in Oregon, it didn't, you know, who, who was going to vote, whether that would be diluting, um, you know, white power, um, none of that really has bubbled up yet. Um, I think part of it is because the suffragists that I have discovered and researched so far, you know, they were in positions of power and privilege. They didn't necessarily feel the need to be public about their views. Um, they were kind of running things from behind the scenes, as were their husbands. 
Um, and so it's going to take some more deep dives, which I'm, I'll be making, but that's what I know at this point. All right. Um, we have a question here about interracial coalitions to achieve suffrage in 1912. Um, and if folks could speak to that a little bit. Kim, I'm going to toss that one to you immediately and see if you could talk some about that. Sure. Um, one of the reasons, in my opinion, that uh, some Oregon women achieved the vote in 1912 was because of coalition building, grassroots coalition building. And there were 23 separate groups in Portland alone and, and dozens across the state. And in Portland, uh, what we know is that there was limited uh, cooperation across uh, lines of ethnicity and race as they were constructed then. So Black women had uh, the Black Women's Council as part of the National Association of Colored Women. They had a suffrage organization, Chinese American women did as well, and a lot of other groups. And so what we know is that we have some evidence that for example, the Black Women's uh, Suffrage Organization signed, uh, edit, signed letters of thanks uh, in the newspaper. They were part of that coalition and uh, there were uh, forums and speakers and so forth. And so this was, uh, this, there's evidence then that they're in this, in this common goal of, of achieving the vote, that there was some uh, uh, cooperation, obviously, this was limited and it was limited uh, by not being an outreach to all groups. So I would say as more newspapers become digitized, as more, you know, we, we really have a, a little more um, to work with in terms of source material, or as we start asking questions of elders about what they know uh, and how, how they uh, heard about what happened, I think we can uh, perhaps expand that even more. Thank you. There's a question that has to do specifically with um, where did Jewish women stand on populist causes in the 1910s? And the, the questioner is thinking about the different cleavages of voting and assumptions of voting patterns based on uh, what they're calling identity politics. And I wonder if, um, I think it would be really interesting to hear you, um, as many of you as care to, speak to some of the ways that you see identity, the intersectional identities of women impacting their votes or not um, in, in different eras or forums. Can you, would you speak to that a little bit? Judy, you might start. Yeah, I mean, I'll start. And I, I really will rely on um, the scholars amongst us to take the question. But I think as I tried to say in my remarks, you know, the, 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 the Jewish community and Jewish women were both trying to find their voice but they were trying to um, comport themselves in a way that would gain them acceptance. And, you know, it was still a time that they were reliant on um, the men of the community who were mostly the workers. So that's why I mentioned prohibition as being one of the reasons that Jewish women, Jewish organizations had anti-suffrage um, leg uh, um, outlooks as opposed to supporting it because they were so worried about about jobs being lost you know as far as popular populism the only um suggestion yeah i'm not sure i can really i'm not sure i really know en enough about it i mean there's this theory that again the jews were very very interested in allowing bartering at a time in their businesses um, with the farmers who would come in from outside of portland that bartering was something they would do at a time where others were saying cash only, right? So again, it was all this looking for acceptance. So even during this time of popul populism where cash was what most businesses in downtown Portland required, the Jewish merchants, but these weren't you know, women, of course, the Jewish mer merchants were saying, you know, go ahead and, and make a barter with us and we'll accept. So again, that's all speaking to their, um, interest in just a general acceptance in the community. Fine. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak to that? Okay. Um, it's a tricky one. 
It is a tricky one. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. I oh, I mean, it's, I just it's tricky when thinking about Jewish women, particularly. I think yeah. it's. Uh, I always love the quote from Esther Pohl Lovejoy that um, we used years ago, Kim, in the title to um, Kim Jensen's Oregon historical piece, quarterly piece on her in the 1912 campaign. And talking about the 1912 campaign, she said there was neither head nor tail to the campaign. And she was answering a reporter's question about how women would vote. And she would say women would vote exactly as how they have campaigned, that they would they would vote their own personal interests and they were not a singular block. Have I got that basically right, Kim? Fabulous. <laughs> okay. It's one of my favorite quotes. I think. And yeah. I, I, I will just add, um, here's the lovely thing about Zoom. My wonderful curator of collections, Anne Levant Paul, just texted me and said, <laughs> you know, and, and it's a good point. There were um, at Beth Israel, which was, was the first synagogue in Oregon, founded 1858, but they had a free kindergarten for all before mm -hmm. there was um, a, a public school system. So, you know, there were ways that I think women were looking at education, uh, that Jewish women were looking at ways to educate the entire population. Mm -hmm. so, thank you, Anne. Yeah, thanks, Anne. <laughs> Angie, there's a question for you that has to do with the impacts of settler colonialism on Native women's um, power within their communities and sort of this idea of enforced gender roles coming from uh, the settler colon colonizers and how much of an impact that had on Native women's power in their communities. And, and can you speak to that? I can. One of the things that I try to put across when I talk about, um, you know, the general Native uh, history and teach Native history is that depending on where you are uh, in this nation, um, you were colonized at a different time in a different way by different people. Um, however, uh, these ideas of whiteness and heteropatriarchy um, certainly affected our communities, right, really strongly. However, there have always been people resisting those ideologies. There have always been people who are uh, going to attempt to live traditionally um, as much as possible people who refused boarding schools, people who used those sites um, as sites of resistance as well. And so I will say that, you know, as much as, um, you know, women were disempowered, there, that has never been complete uh, at all. Um, that women have always had power in our communities and continue to, that um, it's really, uh not not something i think that you can be at all general about um that uh you know the idle no more movement from just what was that 10 years ago already almost you know that was started at a kitchen table in saskatchewan by four mothers like this is what happens i'm sure two nights ago in that line of mothers standing in front of our children downtown there were native mothers you know like um, Native women are incredible people. And so, sure, it might have been in some places that they couldn't be elected to tribal councils or something like that. But if you don't think that they had influence on their communities, you would be sadly mistaken. And I saw another question about the Winya um, group. Um, Urban Indian Council ended at some point. But I grew up in a community that recognized um, a group of very strong women who made things happen from powwows to funerals to educating our kids to making sure that uh, people's needs were met. And, um, you know, Grandma Gertie, Eileen Jasper, Violet Allman, uh, the ball women, like there's just been and continue to be like uh, Native women who um, my friend uh, Michelle Jacob calls the aunties. And right now it's uh, Rachel Cushman and Stephanie Tabibian and me and Michelle and a lot of other strong women who, you know, have the good fortune to be in conversation with each other, to be in good relationship with each other and to, to care deeply about, you know, our tribes and our, and our homelands. Thank you very much. And thanks for finding that other question in the Q&A and, and wrapping that in as well. I'm thinking right now um, about 
how much work there is to be done um, to bring these stories into our dominant narratives about our history and our communities and our present. So I'm grateful to all of you for the work you're doing on that. Um, Linda, there's a question specifically for you about the women who you interviewed and if they moved away from the idea of being a, a good immigrant or um, an assimilationist or assimilationist oriented narrative regarding their voting rights and citizenship and how that persisted into their older age. And there may be something of the, um, the trope of the model minority in this question as well. Could you speak to how some of those women you interviewed dealt with that? Um, first of all, when they came from Japan, uh, the Ona Daigaku, who was, which was the greater learning for women, was, was very prominent. And that really said that uh, when you're a kid, you follow the dictates of your father. When you're married, you follow the dictates of your husband. When you're older, you follow the dictates of your elder son. And so they had learned to be subservient, not to speak out. Uh, not to have voices of their own. The women who immigrated, however, were a little bit more adventurous. They were outgoing, so they were a little bit more willing to, to, to buck the trends. Um, I will say, though, that most of the time, as I mentioned, they spent so much time working and trying to, to gain a living and raise their kids that they really didn't take part in a lot of other issues. Mrs. Is, um, Iwatsuki, whom I mentioned, was really one who stepped forward um, to, to speak out about her rights. So, so there was more in terms of just subsistence of life. When they raised their kids though, their goal was, you're going to be a good American citizen. We're going to send you to school. We're going to make sure you graduate from college. We want you to have the best life ever. And in that way, they were really trying to instill um, strong American values and learning to speak out a little bit more. One woman told me that while I didn't speak out against my husband when he was making me work long hours in the orchard, today I would say something differently. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're all, um, they're all gone now, and so we're glad to have their stories, but um, those were the times then. That's so interesting, thinking about assimilate to what? <laughs> right? And so that's really, thank you, Linda, that's powerful. Um, one other thing related to a question before, this is kind of tangential, but yeah. there was a question about um, um, anti-votes. And when the 1952 McCarran-Walter um, Act passed, which allowed Issei and those from um, Asian Americans to apply for citizenship, the other part of that was there were many who did not want them to immigrate. So the reason, one of the reasons it passed was to put a quota on the number of immigrants who came. And in some years, that was just 100. So that's a little bit tangential, but it somewhat addresses the previous question. Well, you've given me an excellent opportunity before I um, give, pass out the last question, which is to say that um, Dr. Erica Lee will be speaking on her book, America for Americans, A History of Xenophobia in the United States, and has done extensive work on this history. So keep your eye out for that if you're not on the OHS list already. Um, and that'll be a great opportunity to learn more about that history. Okay, the final question. Um, someone is interested in knowing about what extent Oregon suffragists made use of nonviolent civil disobedience, or if there was property destruction or violence against other people. Uh, that was used by suffragists here in the United States, here in Oregon, or Oregon suffragists elsewhere. Um, I think thinking about uh, contemporary times and the role of protest in, in political change and social justice, if folks could speak to that. Kim, you look ready. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're just nodding. <laughs> nodding. Uh, yes, uh, the uh, congressional union that became the National Women's Party uh, embraced uh, nonviolent but very direct uh, civil disobedience um, and best known for being part of protests at the White House uh, in front of the White House and being arrested and hunger striking. Um, there were four women who were part of that in Washington, D.C., uh, Alice and Betty Graham, um, and actually the Wold sisters uh, that uh, were part of that. So there's a, a group but also there were um, members of the National Women's Party in Oregon uh, in, and they were um, 
I don't know that we have information about that, but so yes, Oregon women were part of that uh, broader um, nonviolent action. All right. I was just gonna add one small story, um, referencing the chalk vote that OHS and OWHC is planning for August 26th or the week of that, that day. Um, there was actually some historical precedent of chalking uh, that went on both in Oregon in 1912 and um, the following year in 1913, which would have been leading up as the focus of the National Women's Party became on a federal amendment um, of prominent National Women's Party members um, chalking on the sidewalk uh, near the White House, near Lafayette Park, um, and in fact, they were arrested and their action of merely chalking the phrase of votes for women or the time and the location of a rally or a meeting or a lecture um, was considered radical at the time. So I think how we define things and the terms that we use um, change over time. But again, um, I would consider that nonviolent, non-destructive behavior and activism. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks to all of the attendees for uh, taking an hour to spend with us uh, learning this history and thinking about its, its deep connections to now and the past. Thank you very much to all of our panelists for your work advising the exhibit and speaking today. We are your fans forever and in your debt, and we're just so grateful. So uh, we will um, see you all at the next event. Keep your eye on OHS.org, sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media. Be sure to go grab from the chat all the links you meant to grab for different things today while we were speaking. And um, thanks very much, everyone. Go democracy, go. Bye. <laughs>